before the internet, you were who you are, you knew what you knew, and you knew there was a great deal that you didn't know. You had once known it, but forgotten it, or never learned it, but somebody somewhere knew it. Uh, and because we had this vast, dark companion, the unconscious, bad things keep jumping out of it. Uh, it was remarkable to me that it, throughout the Cold War period, a, a planet ruled by carnivorous monkeys, filled with ideological hatreds, under immense economic and social pressure, and yet nobody ever used atomic weapons except once, the, the two Japanese instances. And in a sense, they don't count because they didn't know what it was. They had to use it to see what it was. And once they saw what it was, remarkable restraint set in. Uh, I would never have guessed that we would have been capable. I mean, remember how deep the fear of the Soviet Union was. Remember that for 35 years, a thermonuclear strike was a possibility within a half an hour of any undue movement on the other side. And yet, somehow we got uh, through that. So there is, in the human animal, an effort to awaken. You know, it was, um, it was H.P., uh, no, no, it was H.G. Wells who said, history is a race between education and catastrophe. And, you know, it is, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's a white knuckle enterprise. You know, catastrophe edges inches ahead, education moves ahead. Uh, and again, if it were a level playing field, I'd be betting on catastrophe because I believe that nature favors the good, the true, and the beautiful. I've got all my money on education. I think we'll make it, but I think we have to scare ourselves to death in order to keep focused. You know, we're, we're primates and we don't really dig in and get rolling until we're painted into a corner. Yeah, ma'am. I guess the answer is to, you have to somehow make it your friend. You have to make it your friend. Uh, there are, there are ways to do that, actually. I made a little list you played right into my hands. Uh, uh, the, the first and probably oldest friend, older even than, than psychedelics, is dreams. Uh, dreams are hugely important. Uh, I was in Australia in February, and I did a lot of reading up before I went down. Uh, the aboriginals of Australia are, have been at the cultural enterprise for a long, long time, along a different path than the rest of us. I mean, I've spent time with Amazon tribes and with people in Central Asia, and yes, they're funky, and yes, they're different, but these Australian Aboriginals are on to something quite other. Uh, many people barely open their eyes. Uh, people sit silently. People don't talk. This again relates to what we said about language. In Australia, among these people, you get the feeling that they don't talk because they're not sure it's here to stay. If if an aboriginal wants to communicate something to you, they would far rather walk with you a half mile into the bush and point at it than to simply describe it back at camp. So uh, the dream time and the Jungian unconscious and the conscious, the unconscious made conscious by the internet begin to sound like the same things. I 
previously didn't have much interest in the Australian Aboriginals because I was slightly irritated by reliant on psychedelics. And so it was like, it was like, what am I supposed to do with these people? They're clearly very loaded and very far out. And how do they do that without drugs? It, it was paradigm agonizing to me. Well, it turns out that they just uh, are better at keeping secrets than the people in the Amazon. There is a revolution breaking over ethnobotany. Uh, we have been saying for decades that South America was the most hallucinogen-rich ecology on the planet, and why was that, and wasn't it fascinating, and so forth and so on. In the next 18 months, uh, some Australian ethnobotanists and, uh, and trippers are going to publish data that shows that the Australian Aboriginal worldview is entirely running on DMT. These acacias, this gum tree ecology that stretches from Queensland uh, down to the south coast, uh, is replete with DMT. It's simply that the Aboriginal culture is even more secretive than other culture, other Aboriginal cultures in other parts of the world. And only very, very slowly is this information uh, uh, being let out. So dreams are one of the great friends of the imagination. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, basically. And there'll be more. It's not for me to take the thunder. Very good people have hundreds and hundreds of pages about to be published, and they've got the data, and they've done the analysis. Uh, yeah. Well, I pretty much take the position that there may be people who can do it on the Natch, but there's no technique. It's something you have to be born to, and there's no culture that can do it. I think throughout the human population, there may be one person in a hundred who has a, a futuristic set of synapses. Because I, I occasionally, in a group like this, somebody will come up to me and say, well, I've never taken a psychedelic drug, but I know exactly what you're talking about, and I see visions and so forth and so on. I used to just think that these people were nutcases. I've now encountered enough of it that I modify my position to say these are just incredibly fortunate people. And you can't tell how much of it is personality and how much of it is chemically real. Again, how, how much of what I'm saying to you right now, it's being processed differently in every head in the room. Some people are seeing pictures, some people are hearing words, some people are logically building on what I say, and for some people it's just music. And so it's, it's very different, and again, it's something very hard to share because it's so uh, subjective. But throughout the world there are what we would call primitive or aboriginal cultures, and some are drug users, and some are not. And it isn't a matter of ecology, it's a matter of something else. Uh, in eastern Ecuador, you have tribes that are just totally druggy, and across the river, people who never touch anything, living basically what appear to the unschooled observer, two cultural systems not that different from each other. So, you know, it's... Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the psychedelic cultures seem more, uh, well, let me put it this way, the psychedelic cultures seem less dogmatic. Shamanism comes in two flavors, at least two. There's what I call a, a, a traditional shamanism is very rigid and ritual-driven and usually non-psychedelic. 
and the other kind of shamanism, uh, there are rituals, but they are basically for the consumer, not the producer. And what shamans in these psychedelic cultures are, are simply alienated intellectuals. You know, I've been in situations in the Amazon where you fly into some remote place and, and the people come and the women come and they want to touch the airplane and they want to look at your camera and touch your clothes and all this. And so while this is going on, meanwhile, standing off is the shaman and he doesn't give a shit about the airplane or your camera or any of that. He is interested in you as a person. And what he is, is he's alienated from the values of his culture. The keeper of the values is the one person who knows that the values are bullshit. <laughs> That's what they're doing in that function. It's like somebody has to know. And so all the people are, you know, kowtowing and going through their business. But the shaman at the top realizes, my God, we stare out onto an abyss. We do not know. And they're like scientists. I mean, they are scientists, essentially. Yeah. Well, th this is an interesting question. There's a hard and soft answer. It depends on whether you think the need to commodify is is so basic to human beings that it can't be removed. If that's true, then the internet still holds out a certain amount of hope. A, a, a hardcore anti-capitalist position wants to eliminate capitalism because it sees it as an unreclaimable evil. Uh, but it's possible that the only thing wrong with capitalism is that it, set, it manufactures, distributes, and commodifies physical objects. What if there was a capitalism that only commodified information and light? Uh, that might be more tolerable. Uh, I, you know, in the future, not that long in the future, if you want to live at Versailles, it'll cost you $149 to buy the software package and set it up and live in it. Well, if Versailles can be made to cost $149, how much is it worth? And the answer is only what the market will pay. So uh, I, I think for a long time, this process of of raising standards of living has been underway. And it is certainly true that today in the world, hundreds of millions of people uh, live better than uh, emperors and kings two centuries ago. So I think the, the important thing, well, before we totally dismiss capitalism, we should see if it can operate in a virtual informational environment less destructively. Uh, if it can't, then something else will have to come along. But certainly capitalism based on the extraction of resources and their fabrication by cheap labor populations into objects to be sold in a central economy, that's, a, that's finished. That's a dinosaur. That's self-limiting. Uh, because there is no, not an ultimately exploitable resource base, the end of that kind of capitalism is, is easily discerned. Well, that's an interesting question. Is there a kind of natural selection of means in the marketplace? Um, there probably is. For example, imagine governments deal with information completely differently than corporations. If a government obtains a proprietary technology, its impulse is to classify it, move it out of sight, and exploit it for political advantage. If a corporation achieves a proprietary technology, it 
drops a huge amount of money on promoting it, rushes products based on it to market, and tries to spread it everywhere as fast as it can. Uh, this certainly has caused an evolution of certain kinds of technology. But the two systems, the, the capitalist corporate system and the governmental system, value and put emphasis on different kinds of technologies. For example, nation states use war as an instrument of national policy. Corporations almost never do that. Uh, corporations don't like war. It busts up environments. It makes products difficult to move around. And where you had happy, healthy customers, you now have hollow-eyed refugees standing around with their hands out. But those were national interests. No corporation could have launched a war like that. It, wa it wasn't Exxon who had a knife poised at their throat. It was the economies of France, Germany, and the United States. Uh, also, that war was generations ago. A completely different set of political rules uh, were in place. Uh, uh, that was probably the last of those sorts of wars, I would bet. Uh, what capitalism does with war is it exports it to already burnt out market areas like Rwanda, Bosnia, Albania. They don't care what people do to each other in those places because they don't have, uh, there's no market there anyway. Uh, let me go on with my list here. I think I got through dreams and drugs, uh, which were probably the biggies. This is Friends of the Imagination, in case you lost your place here. Uh, uh, fiction and the enterprise of fiction, not necessarily science fiction, although it's interesting if you look at the golden age of science fiction, uh, the magazines that created that had names like Amazing, Astounding, and if, these are the very words and themes that we've been pursuing around here. But fiction is, uh, until we get virtual reality up and running in the hands of a master, the best way we have of showing each other the contents of our own head. Any of you who have made your way through the remembrance of things past, Proust's enormous novel about fin de siècle life in Paris. There are thoughts uttered there that are so fragile and delicate that when you read it, you think you were the only person who ever thought this, and you never bothered to mention it to anybody because it seems so ineffable, and yet Proust has gotten it down on the page. So it, it shows you what human beings are.